getting into the business, the music business that is. Um, this is the first episode. I am Vinny Venom, music producer, remixer, songwriter, uh, record owner, uh, apparel, businessman, and uh, entrepreneur. So I'm going to talk about a lot of things uh, regarding music and what I have done uh, and continue to do on a regular basis. I'm going to give some people some suggestions, some ideas. Um, maybe these ideas will work for you. Maybe they won't, but it'll give you an understanding and a set way to go about certain things that maybe you did not know how to go about them before. Like I said, um, my name is Vinny Venom. I grew up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Um, Growing up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, I got to know a lot of different music and a lot of people that created all that type of different music. At an early age, I always enjoyed doing music and I always loved being involved in music one way or another. And for some reason, music was always brought into my life um, by meeting certain people that were involved in music themselves. Uh, either being music producers, songwriters, rappers, uh, etc. But I started figuring out as life went on, more and more things that were involved with music that really had nothing to do with music, but eventually later on in life and many years following um, had a lot to do with music. Um, Music started off um, eventually at one point where there wasn't anything as uh, there wasn't anything where you could actually send a link or an MP3 or a WAV file because they did not exist at that time. Everything was either vinyl and then eventually being uh, a CD, uh, sending stuff out to DJs and people, record labels, A and Rs, um, and people involved in any capacity of music and what situation that you were trying to get across. Um, you had to get vinyl pressed and vinyl was very expensive. You had to get a lacquer pressing and you had to get it mastered and everything cost money. And so you had to get all these records pressed and you had to have um, to send them out to DJs and hoping that they're going to listen to it and possibly play it. Um, Where nowadays things are much easier. People could send out a MP3, a WAV file, a link, Um, and send something to so many people as I send stuff to everyone around the world. In the matter of your own home, you have the access to sending files to so many people, um, either be via uh, Dropbox or WeTransfer or WeSendIt and all these other um, loading platforms that you could use as a loader to send stuff out to people, especially stuff that are very high in um, downloads and uh, you have the ability to send them out um, to so many people around the world where now it's not as, it's much easier and less costly than getting vinyl pressed where you did before. Um, I always was a person that I always looked into things. I continue to do that on a regular basis every single day. Um, growing up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, I hung out with much older guys than younger guys. Um, and I learned a lot from these older, uh, people that I got to know and got to know about them. And because you have to understand older or wiser, you learn a lot more because these people went through things that probably you haven't gone through yet. So they could give you advice and pointers, um, and say, hey, I went down that road. It doesn't really work. Um, I'm just telling you this because I know because I went down that and certain things I went through, uh, I want to make sure that people that I know, I can give them a little bit assurance that, you know, this is not the right way of doing something, you know, figure out a different way. But I always had the ability to be able to notice things on my own. Um, always was taught things like um, 
treat people with respect, treat people the way you would want to be treated. If somebody doesn't treat you the way you would want to be treated, then there's no reason to be around that person. Um, let go of those people nice and slow. Don't uh, insult them. Just, just go on your way. And if you see them, just say hello and goodbye and move on with your life and just understand that certain people in life uh, help you grow and then there's certain people that just don't let you go anywhere in life. Um, and being around a lot of people and learning and observing and seeing things for myself uh, and a lot of people, you know, successful people always say, always be around people that you are going to grow with them and you, go, you guys are going to grow together um, and help each other in the, at the end of the day. Uh, don't be around people that bring you down and are not going places on their own and not going to take you going anywhere either. So you have to figure out for yourself what's the right way and what's the wrong way. And nine out of 10, you always know what the wrong way is. So you should know that it's the wrong way to do something. So you shouldn't attempt to actually do it because knowing that it's the wrong way and there's going to be consequences for following that wrong way pet. Um, I believe everything in life uh, happens. Sometimes, crazy as it sounds, things happen for a reason. Um, a lot of people are working nine to five. Some people working two or three jobs trying to survive. And in the process of that, working those three jobs, um, also following their uh, their fantasies, their goals, their dreams, and trying to make them happen so they don't have to work those three jobs anymore. Um, I hear a lot of people saying that, you know, I'm working this job, but it's barely paying the bills. You know, I had to take on another job to pay the bills and I'm really not happy. I'm not really content because I'm doing something that really doesn't make me feel that I'm doing what I was set out to do and what I'm trying to do and what I believe is set out to do in general and what was my gift. Um, for some reason, everything on that level is holding back and trying to figure out for myself where I need to go about it. And there's so many people in that situation that end up giving up and, um, I actually spoke about this a while ago and saying stuff like nobody knows the amount of people that commit suicide every year, especially uh, entertainer, entertainer people, artists um, that just get fed up with everything because what they really want to do in life, they're not able to do it anymore because for some reason they're having issues and obstacles in their path. And they're just saying to themselves, you know, I can't deal with this anymore. So I'm just going to throw in the towel and just give up. And so many people have done that that I know, talented people. And they just, a lot of them tell me and say, hey, man, I hand it to you because I couldn't do it anymore. I just had to give up because it was too stressful. It was too uh, overbearing. It, it, it kept taking me, you know, to the point where I just wanted to pull my hair out of my head and, and I couldn't do it anymore. So I figured I'd just give up and just continue to do what I was doing. And eventually I'll find something else in life that'll make me happy. And then they never find that. And they're always not content of what they're doing. And to the point where they start getting sad to say, hating life and hating every day and seeing it every day as being a day that doesn't do anything for them. They're not going anywhere. They're not fulfilling their fantasy, their dreams, and they're just stuck. And that's a horrible way to be. You have to understand in life, there's always obstacles. There's always um, things that we have to go through to get through something that we want something in, a, in the most uh, abundance way, you know. So everything takes time. And I always say time is the one thing that we have and we have so much of it but we don't have any as much time as we think we have of it you know time is something that you can't get back so once you know the clock starts ticking and you know the hours and the seconds move 
you could never get those back because if we could imagine how many things could be changed and how many things could have been reversed and how many things could have not happened because you knew something was going to occur that you really wasn't happy on it happen in general. So as a producer, as a music um, influencer, and um, I started to realize there's a lot of things involved in just creating music. There's other things, there's other plateaus, there's other structural uh, understandings that you need to get involved in before things can happen. Like no one knew that for some reason that you couldn't, uh, after an amount of years passed, you know, it was, people always ask me, is it, was it easier then uh, than it was now? Um, it was different. It was totally different. Um, nowadays, you're having a lot of people getting so much music every single day. Um, I mean, you have new music Tuesdays, new music Fridays. And you're getting music not just from one area, but you're getting it from many areas all over the world. You're getting stuff from Italy. You're getting stuff from Germany. You're getting stuff from Britain. You're getting stuff from uh, Israel. You're getting stuff from 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 uh, Belize. You're getting stuff from Spain. You're getting stuff from uh, all over, all over Asia, all over India, everywhere. So, and all over the U.S., you're getting place, uh, music from New York. You're getting place, music from California. You're getting music from Jersey. You're getting music from everyone. And people say to me, why is that? Because now it is so easier to create music. I mean, you could create music on your phone and save the files and then transfer them to your DAO, either be Logic Pro X or either uh, Ableton or, or Cubase or Pro Tools or all these other programs that are out there. Uh, FL Studio and you can go home and create something on your phone and then go home and continue taking it to the next level on your computer. Um, I always tell people if you're going to get equipment, start off slow. Don't start off uh, getting so much of the stuff where you overwhelm yourself um, and you're not going to be able to um, connect to everything. I always say get one piece of equipment and know it backwards and forwards. And then once you know that backwards and forwards, then get the material and the things needed to work with that piece that you know backwards and forwards. And then learning all about that other piece that's going to contribute together with that other piece. So you have two units that are working sub, sub, side by side with each other and you know them backwards and forwards so you can get a lot more stuff done than not getting a lot of stuff more done. So uh, I remember this because I remember one of my mentors, and I'll be talking a lot of my mentors and who I learned from and reason why I'm doing music for those people out there, these artists, these amazing uh, celebrities, uh, and I still respect them to this day. You got people like Omar Santana, you got Lenny D, you got Frankie Bones, you got Junior Vasquez, you got Jelly Bean Benitez. You got uh, Axial, you got uh, Tomlin, you got Brain Basement, uh, this other producer that I worked with, um, Rick Ben Shooting, amazing. I worked with him at a Laughing Dog, and then I worked with Vince McLean, and I worked in studios like Quad with him, and uh, Unique, Battery, uh, uh, Hit Factory, um, and so many other studios uh, that I worked in. It's, back in the days and then I worked in other studios where they, they were their home studios uh, like I worked with Charles Alexander studio and he worked with Joe Decees, Mary J. Blyde uh, uh, Heavy D, Bag of Blue Funk uh, LL Cool J uh, Three Shots to the Dome I worked with all these amazing wonderful artists and people that I learned from them something out of each of them you mean, um, I remember me being uh, going up to the New York Hotel because in the New York Hotel, a lot of these producers and artists had their base studios there. You had Omar Santana, you had Arthur Baker, you had Africa Bambada, you had Zulu Nation, you had Cutting then opening up their office out there. Uh, you have Nile Rogers <coughs> and uh, Shaolin. <clears throat> and you had so many other people there 
<clears throat> to the point that I got to meet so many people and got to see what they can do and how they do it on a regular basis. Um, and it was amazing just figuring out how people do things uh, and where they've been and how they got there. Um, remembering going to the studio and Omar opening up the door and seeing all his gear and seeing all these keyboards that he had um, and explaining to me all these keyboards, each keyboard, what was resp responsible for a track um, like Be Joey Beltram's Dominator. Uh, it was the Alpha Juno 2 and he actually played the lead for Dominator. I'm the one and only Dominator. I'm the one and only Dominator. You know, it's like, and he created that sound. And I was like, wow, that's where that sound came from. So I started to know what piece of synthesizer was connected to a sound that put out that hit song that I go crazy for hearing it. Um, you know, all these songs like Dominator, uh, James uh, L.A. Style, James Brown is Dead, uh, El Fontana. Um, all these music that you, that I grew up listening and loving, um, and then seeing <clears throat> people like Omar creating a hardcore track right in front of my eyes was amazing. Um, and seeing the labels that were putting out stuff and stuff that was Omar that was on, on those labels and, and, um, Lenny D, um, going to Sonic Groove. Uh, that was um, Frankie Bones' uh, record store and his brother and Heather Hunt, H Heather Hunt that was on there with them. So going there and looking at vinyl and listening to stuff and listening to concepts and ideas of what people were doing and experimental sounds and whatnot and figuring out, wow, this is amazing, just knowing what, how much music is out there and what people are doing and all the arrangements and all the effects and all the sound designs that are, are connected to those music melodies and, 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 and anthems and whatnot. It blew my mind. So that's why when people hear me do music, um, I kind of do like a smash potato kind of thing. I do just throw everything in and you, you, you'll be like, wow, it sounds like, like garbage. It sounds like everything's all over the place. And then when I finish everything, they're like, wow, how did he go from this to this? Some people work different than everyone else. Everyone else has their own technique. Everyone has their own style. Everyone has their own ability to do certain things in certain ways. Where, you know, certain people just like, eventually now I'm the same way. Um, I don't like working in big studios. I think it, was, um, it would take away from my concentration. Um, I would work harder because I wasn't paying attention. Uh, I actually like working in a, my home studio because I'm by myself. I actually put the lights down low and just the light of the computer and I just start working. I just, there's no hesitation, there's no distractions. I just get stuff done. Um, and I was never one of those guys, but a lot of the other people that I worked with were like that. And kind of now it kind of streamlined to me now also that, that I, that concept that I like working out of home. I like being involved and just doing stuff on my own on, you know, on that level where before I didn't have, um, the opportunity. I always say to people, um, cause Back in the day, I didn't have gear. I would have to go to studios. And the studios that I would go to, you know, they would give you a certain rate, but you had to lock it out, lock it in for this amount of hours. Otherwise, they wouldn't give you that rate. So you have to understand when you're in the studio and you're trying to figure out a concept, a structure, a foundation of where you're going with a track that takes time. So let's say you book a studio time for... Eight hours, right? Okay. Um, you, you locked it for eight hours at a $50 time set price of where they're going to charge you. Every hour is $50 that you're going to be paying the studio and the person involved running that session that is working for the studio, you're going to be paying them that amount of money. <clears throat> so 
by the time you get your gear or by the time everything is set up and everything is ready to go, time already has passed. Remember, time is the one thing that we have, but we don't have much of it. And once it goes, it goes for good. You start realizing that even more when you have a set time and the time is costing you money. More time, money, time costs, you know, is time is money. That's the saying, and it's true. So I started realizing things uh, and started seeing things where I needed to go with these and go with this. Um, Because I started adding stuff up, and I was saying to myself, because when you go to a studio and you don't even have an idea, you don't even have the sounds and everything, you have to create those sounds. That takes time. That takes a lot of time. Twisting knobs, moving LFOs, moving envelopes, arranging oscillators, uh, putting notch filters and whatever filters you're working with, distortion, effects, delay, um, re, re, you know, re, uh, reverb, all these things, and getting sounding perfect, you know, soar wave, a triangle wave, you know, a smooth wave, uh, you know, a, a harder wave, a, a super saw wave. This takes time to get a sound connected to where you're trying to go in whatever your production you're trying to put out. And then the thing is all these sample CDs that everyone buys, everyone has the same samples and they're using the same stuff. So even though you're creating something from these samples, many other people are doing the same amount of things with those samples. So I'm not saying that um, using samples are not good, but change them around a little bit, chop them up. Um, I know Tim, um, Tim Berg, Avicii, an amazing friend and an amazing producer, an amazing human being. And we lost him and we lost a real great uh, piece of our life in the music industry because he took music to a different level than if it ever was. He brought it somewhere totally different and he let us see what, music can do and what music can bring a lot of people together and a lot more stuff can be combined to music, different styles, different arrangements. And remember that Tim used to get, even though getting samples, he would chop them up and come up with his own recipes of ideas. So he would grab that snare, he would grab that hi-hat, he would grab a different loop and arrange it in a different way and put different loops and hi-hats and different um, toms or whatever, or whatever they may be, snares, um, to different pieces and arrange something totally different, even though he, they were samples, he was putting his own version to it. So he was creating something that was created, but he was recreating it to his preference. Um, so whatever you were hearing was totally different, even though it was from a sample pack, um, the way he sliced and chopped everything up and rearranged everything, it was totally different than it was from what, you know, originally was expected from uh, everybody else started seeing different ways and different uh, ideas and capabilities to work with music on a different level than they usually worked with before. Um, I remember I worked with a partner of mine, Dave, and um, we were working on the track and we were working on it for a while and um, we were having a problem because something wasn't fitting in. So from my experience, learning a lot from other producers and figuring out things uh, like stuff like that, I said, oh, let's try a zipper effect, thinking that he knew what I was talking about and he didn't know what what I was talking about. So I had to tell him what to do and what to layer on top of each other and give it that effect as a zipper uh, opening up and entering, you know, the part, the outro melody to go in. And he didn't get it at first until he created it and then he saw how amazingly it worked with what we were trying to do. So you have to understand, I learned a lot from people and people learned a lot from me and I passed on that knowledge to other people and they will 
eventually pass it on to other people and the cycle keeps going and going and repeating itself and giving other people that new and old knowledge together and then they come up with their own brand new concept of what we did with maybe shorter version and maybe easier version that originally was. You will see it for yourself. You will see when you finally finish something and you're so proud and happy of how it sounds, that's a great feeling in the world. So I learned a lot and I realized the abundancy of how far people can go doing music. But it all takes the drive and the ambition that the person has and continues to have in life. So he, um, certain people told me certain things that I, to this day I still implement them, <clears throat> whatever I'm trying to do. And uh, I kind of come up with my own um, now formula. Um, that's usually what happens. People teach you things. And then eventually you come up with your own ideas and your own concepts from those ideas from back in the day. So you have to understand, um, I learned a lot. Um, I grew up, like I said, in Brooklyn. Um, I hung out with older guys. So I learned from them, you know, what to do, what not to do. I learned from my grandfather, of course. I learned from my mom. Um, you remember these things, even though these people are not around anymore, they still live in your brain and you remember the things that they said to you, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Always be courteous, always be, uh, always be respectful. Uh, don't talk out of line, you know, always keep it civil. There's a lot of things that were told to me and brought to my attention. Um, I've seen a lot of crazy things happen too growing up in Brooklyn. You know, it's part of life. You know, I had certain friends of mine uh, that are no longer here anymore. People always ask me, um, you know, what's crazy? And I'm like, crazy is, uh, I knew people that were so crazy that they're no longer here. They're in the cemetery. You know, there was people that they didn't think twice um, because that was how they were. They were. They didn't take no crap from anybody. They didn't um, relate to it. I don't think they ever did. Um, they always reacted the same way. They would always um, be very, very uh, aggressive at their actions to the point where um, a lot of them are not here. And then I started seeing things for myself Um and then I started seeing things for myself and saying to myself, hey, this is not the right way to go because if I continue on this path, I'm going to end up like them or even worse than them. So I started pulling back from where I was and where I was at at the time. So I said to myself, um, maybe um, I need to go a different path way a different path because this path is not working as we can see um and i took a different way about it um i got you know going to different locations and different neighborhoods because um when i i started working um the truth is i was um messing around with these girls and i was dating uh seeing one of the one of the sisters and at that time they knew this producer and this producer was um, Jerry Khalees Hashim and he had the biggest breakdancing record out at the time and I believe it still is at this moment. Uh, if you guys seen the movie Straight Outta Compton and there was the scene where Dre, uh, and I don't remember, I believe Easy e was in the room and a couple of other of his boys and he was chopping up, showing off and cutting up uh, a song and it said, it's time. Well, that was Jerry and uh, Aldo Marin's song. Um, and I believe that was Aldo. Uh, yes, Aldo said it in an interview. That was him on the vocorder saying that. And that's how it came up with it's time. And it's amazing because 
meeting Jerry eventually because of these girls uh, and because they told him I was a great rapper and he needed a, a, an Italian rapper. So I fit the bill. So I didn't drive at the time because I was really young. I didn't have a license. So transportation would be uh, getting on the L, getting on the train, um, getting on the B and then transferring to the blue line and um, going up all the way out to Washington Heights, an area that I did not know. Uh, I mean, I got out of the train and I was like a bird in a falling off from the nest and being in this whole big forest, not knowing where he where he fell from and not knowing how he's going to get back there. But I figured it out and um, went up and met uh, Jerry and met <clears throat> his friend that had a studio, a bedroom studio. And uh, basically they had, I believe, a uh, eight track recorder, a Tascam. Uh, back in the days, people started off with small uh, gear like that in, in, in that level. Nothing extravagant because either it didn't exist at the time or it was in big studios or it cost very much to get it. Um, I knew because I looked into it and some of these gears back in the days where you would pay $1,000 for them uh, now, maybe $1,300 or $2,000 or some of them are really high advance and you're talking five grand, but a simple keyboard um, that normally would have gone go for now for let's say $400 you could get something and you can work in the studio and create stuff at home and whatnot back in the day you would have to buy these analog keyboards that could cost you from $5,000 to $10,000 and up um, you could get them used but they're still going to cost you they're still pricely um, you know you could buy them on places like Rogue uh, where I actually purchased stuff or you could actually go on um, I don't think even Craigslist existed at the time. I think there was this magazine called The Buy and Sell. I think that's what it was called. And you would have people listing all the stuff they were selling, either be music gear, car, furniture, you name it, they would have it on there. Uh, later on in the years, Craigslist developed and showed up. But until then, there was nothing like that. It was just me calling you and saying... Uh, Hey, so-and-so, I'm looking for this piece of gear. I hear you have it. Uh, what's the price? And they would say, well, this is what I'm asking for it, but I could be negotiated. You know, what do you believe you want to give me? And I would give a price, say, hey, that's a little too low. Maybe let's pump it up another $20. And I said, okay, that's fine. And I always tell people to start off really slow and especially Back then, the gear was so expensive and so pricely. You didn't really want to buy something that was going to break the bank. Um, but besides, uh, I started seeing a lot of things and <clears throat> techniques and equipment that people used. And one of the pieces that blew my mind was a reel-to-reel. -reel. Um, going out there, besides Jerry, I started meeting a lot more of his producer friends and I started to get accustomed to them and we started becoming friends and you know associating much more uh if i didn't come to see jerry i would go to see people like rob razor and uh <clears throat> watching them on a reel to reel and editing and slicing tape and to put tracks together bit by piece by just putting tape together and taping it together and putting it on this block and chopping it up and running the reel and you hear and not knowing what the hell was going on, it sounds like a bunch of munchkins just running, um, but stopping it at the point and cutting it and marking it with the white pencil and knowing exactly where everything was blew my mind. I was like, how the hell do they know how to do this? How is this happening? I'm learning something that is mind blowing to me because I have no idea what's happening and what's going on but all i know is that whatever they were doing it was working uh the edit sounded amazing there was repeating echoes there was drop uh stop start effects and there was these amazing um zap effects they were doing and it was just amazing they were creating a different 
music element by just putting tape together and combining it with everything else. And that made a song, you know, stuff that you were hearing on the radio. But then um, going up to Washington Heights, and I remember when I first get out of the train, I felt like I was lost. Um, This Italian kid, I didn't fit in. I definitely didn't fit in. My neighborhood was totally different. Everybody was Italian. Everybody knew each other. Now I'm going off the train onto the street, uh, going up the stairs, and I'm in an area where I don't know where it was. And at the time when I was at Washington Heights, things were really bad. There were shootings left and right. Um, You would hear uh, sirens every minute, uh, people throwing stuff off the roof. It was not something that I was accustomed to. But for some reason, it became normal to me. Um, I was like walking one day and somebody got thrown off a building. It was crazy. Uh, Just nuts just seeing things like that happening. Um, Well, not seeing somebody thrown off the building, but somebody almost fell on me, literally. Um, Didn't see who the person was. And if uh, I didn't know what was going on, I was like, you know, a deer in headlights. Um, but the things that I seen going through and going to the outcome of me creating music, going to this neighborhood and seeing all the crazy stuff that was happening in between that. And, you know, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, I believe. And I believe that's true. Um, so understand when I went out to... Washington Heights. Um, I didn't know the area, so Jerry had introduced me to everybody. So he thought that he was looking out for me, but I actually looked out for myself. Um, Because understanding, remember what I said, I always uh, hung out with older guys and they always looked out for me and they always asked me, um, how's everything going? How's everything? Because I used to tell them I'm going out to Washington Heights. You know, you know, I got friends out there. Let me know if there's any issues and, you know, But it was crazy because even though I was in a neighborhood that I did not belong in, I always had people looking out after me. It was crazy. For somebody uh, that I knew, knew someone in an area or near there would always say, hey, if this guy comes there, just let you know he's with me, you know, Um, look out for him, make sure everything's okay. And it was crazy because I would get when I would meet the guys that I hung out with, older guys, they would say, hey, you know, you know, my buddy, you know, told me good things about you. He met you and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, who do you not know? And it was like the funniest thing because he just smiled and I got it. He's like, you know, even though you're not in this neighborhood, in, in our neighborhood, we still, we still got you. You know what I mean? And it was crazy because when Jerry came to my neighborhood and Jerry got to see the people that I knew and the people that, I hung out with and the people that I associated with, I actually looked out for him when he was in my neighborhood and it was the opposite when I was in his neighborhood because when I went there, there's always someone looking to uh, make waves and I've had a couple of the people out there when I went out to Washington Heights that were trying to, uh, you know, push, you know, rattle the cage Uh, and then uh, I didn't even say nothing, you know, Jerry went over to him and said, hey, there's people you mess around with and there's people you don't mess around with. This is the one person you don't mess around with. And I kind of got to know people and people got to know me and they kind of respected me and I respected them. Um, A lot of pretty Dominican women out there, that was something new for me, something definitely uh, exciting to see. Um, As you you get older, you you appreciate women more uh, and you start seeing different... um, different races of, of, of ethnic groups of, uh, of people. So you start to see different environments, different styles of what they do. Um, you know, I remember years ago I worked um, for my father's friend. He passed away. Great guy, Louis. I used to fix copy machines. And um, I remember going out. I didn't drive at the time either. And I remember we used to get these broken down machines and and they were all dirty and they looked like they would need to be thrown away. And he showed me with all the chemicals and everything to uh, 
re refurbish those things like they were brand new. I mean, we would have something and then he would order the parts. And I learned so much from this guy. Uh, he would order the parts and that were missing and we would add those parts to it and clean everything, clean the metal, clean the iron, uh, put new drums in, put new blades in, put new wires in. And from something being totally old and totally um, something that would never, you could imagine in a million years that someone would actually buy it or rent it because back in the days, um, it wasn't like it is now. You didn't get a uh, copy, ma uh, copy machine or a fax machine. And um, you would have to have someone like me come there and repair it for you and change the toner and change the blade and the drum. The drum was this expensive uh, thing that looked like a big uh, cl close uh, uh, dough rolling pin, but thicker. Uh, it, 9 out of 10, it would be gold. And it was very expensive. It was $300, I remember at the time. And 9 out of 10, certain people didn't take the staples out of the machine. It would, it would, it would uh, scratch um, the, the drum. And so when you made copies, the, the image would show those scratches that the staples would fall down on the drum. And then when it made the image, it would come out on the paper. So you have all these chicken feet that's what they look like and that's what he described them to me and that's what i used to call them so i had to put a new drum in there and i used to go to these neighborhoods that were not neighborhoods that i normally would go but i started realizing different ethnic groups of people different nationalities and how they live and how they go by their everyday uh lifestyles um and I'm always a person that always wants to ask questions and, and find out things because that's who I am. And I asked, um, I remember I worked in uh, Borough Park. I worked with, for a lot of Hasidic Jews, great guys, um, great people. And they used to tell me these things like, hey, you know, this is what you need to do. So I learned a lot from a lot of people uh, back in the days. Um, just by being around them. And I always ask questions because I remember I worked for these two brothers uh, and they own a speaker company. And I'm not going to say who the speaker company is now. It's a huge company. But I worked with them back in the days before they were another name. And um, I always asked them because I knew they were worth a lot of money and they were really nice down to earth people. And they always respected me and they always took care of me. They always used to give me good tips and took care of me for Christmas, and that was a great thing. They would say, hey, this is for the job, this is for the labor, this is for you uh, getting our machine running, and this is uh, a bonus, you know what I mean? And they always used to ask me when my birthday was. Crazy to sound, I'm like, what does it make a difference? And I'm like, and when I would, hey, here's a card, here's, here's some money, and I was like, wow, you know, this is really, really nice. And... um I started seeing different people's attitudes and different how people acted and how people went about business. You know what I'm saying? There were certain people that would give me a hard time and, you know, try to finagle me and, you know, try to get o over on paying the bill or paying half of it <clears throat> or not even close to it. And then I started learning from, you know, my boss, Louis, and say, you know, there's nice to a point and then you have to understand everything in life, especially when we're trying to run a business. It's a business. So they have to understand that too. And I had to have points where I had to tell the people, well, if you don't have the bill paid today or at least half of the bill paid today, I'm going to have to have the machine removed from you, you know. And a lot of them didn't want to hear it. But then there were certain people that didn't care about it. They just cared about me keeping their money, their, their, well, their money going, of course, because if copy machine is very important because they have to send out invoices and bills and whatnot. And I remember uh, certain people that used to say to me, hey, all we, our main concern is you keep on up us running with the machine, everything running on a great level where we have no problems because we rely on this machine very highly and we need you to keep up and we need to keep up with the maintenance on this machine so we can keep on with our business. And they understood that and I understood that also. But 
learning a lot from a lot of people. And I asked the questions to these two brothers and I said to them, I said, could I ask you a question? I said, um, what are you guys worth? I was not, I was being, honestly, I said, what are you guys worth? And they're like, they weren't offended. They were actually impressed that I actually asked them that. And I said, what do you mean? What am I worth? What's, what's my bank account worth? What's my portfolio worth? I said, what are you worth in general? He said, well, you have to understand I was, what was I, 16, 17 maybe? Uh, 16 just turned 17 and um, don't know anything about this stuff. So I'm asking him, I'm like, what are you worth? You know, legit. And he's like, you know, total in the bank account, what are you worth? And he's like, well, I'm worth about $28 million if that's what you're asking. My brother is older and he's been in the business longer than me. So he's definitely worth more than me. I said, what is he worth? He said about 80 million. I was like, wow, 28 million, 80 million between both of them. Wow. I'm like, how did you get to that level? And I said, uh, is there any secrets? Is there any uh, advice you can give me? Because the only advice I could give you, find something that you're great at, enjoy doing it, Enjoy the people that you're around that's involved in what you're doing. And every day that you do that, it's not going to be a job. It's going to be something that you're going to do for fun. And you're going to love doing it. And it's going to make you create a living and you're going to get profit from it. And you're going to be amazed because you're doing it with all your heart and all your ambition and all your soul that you're going to put everything into it but you're going to love doing it and at the end you're going to get the money even though you're not expecting it it's going to come anyway because you're doing something you love you're doing something you enjoy doing and whatever you're putting out whatever it may be it might be helping a lot of people and bringing happiness to them so that's going to bring happiness to you. And I was like, wow, that's some great advice right there. So nowadays, I always realize that certain people are doing things in their lives that they're not really happy with. They're just doing it to pay their bills, pay their electric, their gas, their uh, home insurance, their car insurance, their kids' tuition, you know. But a lot of them have other things that... They want to do, um, but having hard times doing it. I always tell people, if you quit doing something, then you're pretty much locking yourself out of everything. Once you quit, you can't. I'm not saying once you quit, you can't go back. You always could go back. But once you quit, whatever moment it may be, you're basically stopped in that, in that moment. I always tell people, if you're having a hard time doing something, stop, revise yourself, go back and figure out the mistakes that you might have made and try to repair them or try to understand saying, hey, I did this, it didn't work out, so let me try something different and something that's going to work out for me in the long run. You know, um, life is really, really short. Um, I'm going to touch on something and I'm going to let people know. A lot of people know this. A lot of people don't know this. A lot of people know about me and a lot of people don't know about me. Um, there's certain things in life that money can never buy. And what is that? They say, could money buy happiness? Yes, it can. Could it buy health to a point? Could it buy getting back someone that you care about if they're at the point where they're doing not so good health-wise. Sometimes they can't. I know that for a fact because um, years, I mean, well, my mom passed away in 2018, but before she passed away, she went through a lot of things going back and forth to doctors and seeing what my mom went through and the only thing that kept me going was me keeping myself busy and doing music at that time. And at that time, even though my mom was in the hospital, she was still in the hospital. She still was coherent. You still could talk to her. I still had her around. So I was scared, nervous, but not as scared and nervous that eventually I was going to be. So 
my my blanket was me going in front of my computer and creating music. But then my mom at one point, she got sick one time and then she didn't get sick after like two years and then she got sick every six, every other year and then she would get every, sick every six months to the point where she would be sick every 12 days. The reason why she was on antibiotics once the antibiotics ran out, you know, to the point the body would start getting infected. Once the body got infected, she would get ammonia. Her lungs would get scarred to the point where my mom needed a double lung transplant. And everybody says, you know, money could buy everything. Money can't buy everything. Money can't buy health. Money can't buy organs. Um, They don't come that easy. Sometimes they don't come at all. In my uh, situation, they didn't come at all. Um, My mom was a small person, small statue. Uh, liver, kidneys uh, can be actually, doesn't matter if the person is heavy, skinny or whatever, the size could always be used no matter what. So there's more opportunities of someone getting a liver or a kidneys. It just has to be that person's blood type and, you know, in that, in that ability, then that person could donate their liver and kidney, a piece of their liver and one of their kidneys to another recipient that is needing a uh, kidney transplant or a liver transplant. When it comes to somebody needing more than anything a lung transplant, that comes harder than ever you could imagine because the lungs has to fit the, the, the body, uh, the body um, structure of that person. It could be an inch smaller, an inch bigger, nothing more. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Um, and a lot of people don't know, once you get a transplant, it's not over yet. You still have to be on immunosuppressants because the body doesn't recognize that organ as being your own and it can reject it. So you have to take all these medications on that. And you're also giving up your immune system. So your body is not as powerful that it was from before you getting sick and needing a transplant. So I always ask people, the most important thing in life is health and family, you know, and happiness. You know, uh, you can't, I always tell people, and this is going to be just about music. It's going to be about everything because, you know, music and everything in life is combined together. It's like one big um, ball of, of, uh, of, yarn or, or, or rubber bands and you know, you're know you constantly adding to it and adding to it so it overwhelms you where you can't even hold it anymore. Um, so I try to tell people, you know, um, sometimes you get people that have all the money in the world, but they lose someone that meant more than anything of all the money in the world and that money doesn't mean anything to them anymore because they realize what it's really about, it's totally, life is totally about something different than we all would never imagine that we are going to lose someone we care about, someone that, you know, fed us and deprived themselves of vitamins and nutrition to feed us in their, in their womb. Um, I was really close to my mom to the point in 2018, uh, uh, I used to always hate the month of March, but now I hate it even more. March 12, 2018, when it comes around, I just wish it just overpasses everything and just, I don't even, it doesn't even come there. You know, it doesn't even, I don't even see that month or that day. But we all have a number. We don't know when it is. I don't think everybody wants to know the day that we are not going to longer be on this earth because then we would be thinking about it too much. And that's something that, God knows that number, but we don't. We only know, everybody knows that number when the time comes for us. So like I always say, tomorrow is never promise. So we should live life to the fullest and do everything under the sun that we believe we need to do before we leave this earth. Because once we leave this earth, we don't get another chance. You know, we will live in eternity um, 
always used to be afraid of of dying, but now that you know so many people that I care about up there, especially my mom, and I know when my time comes, I know she'll be waiting for me in open arms and uh, remembering her and seeing her healthy, not seeing her the way she left this earth, but seeing her the way I remember her, happy, smiling, you know, um, always telling me how much she loved me and how much I care for her, how much we care for each other. So I remember it's going to, I know it's going to be a big party when I go out there and get to see her once again and see everyone else that we no longer have with each other on this earth. And I remember and know uh, that a lot of us um, don't realize a lot of things Uh, a lot of things until we lose all the things that mean the world to us. I would never think in a million years that, you know, I would lose my mom. I thought she was the most strongest person in the world. Um, I thought she could get over anything. But I'm going to talk about a lot of things. Uh, This is just, I know this is a long um, video, but I just wanted to give everybody a foresight of where um, I've been and what I've been doing and where I'm going and I'm going to do something where I'm not going to be able to play anyone's music on here because copy infringement and I don't want to get flagged and I don't want anyone else um, to get in trouble. So what I'll do is I believe I can do, I will put up uh, Vinnie Venom music recommendation. It doesn't have to be EDM, it doesn't have to be hip hop, just music. Whatever you're putting out and you believe that it needs to be heard, I will listen to it. If I really like it and I believe that I should put it on the top five list, then I will do that. I'm going to be really honest to you. I'm not going to downplay uh, because that would be misleading to you. I'm going to be, if something doesn't sound right, I'm going to tell you if something... um, sounds off or something could have been done better or the traction of even put out in the first place, I'm going to bring that up to you because that's going to help you in the long run grow and understand that sometimes we have to take time to get to one point in time to get to that level that we need to be because we're not there yet. I always tell people that I'm working with, you know, they'll let me hear stuff and I'm like, hey, you're not ready. You know, like, what are you talking about? just delete the whole track and from where i'm seeing you going your arrangement your 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 frequencies and all your layers and stuff like that you're everywhere everything doesn't sound right everything's off everything is off centered you need a lot more work you need a lot more understanding music theory you need to lo- look at more music and listen to it and see the layers and the patterns and the melodies and where they're going and the drops and the intros and the outros and vice versa. And that's how you're going to learn. And unfortunately, you're going to go through mistakes and a lot of them till you get to the point where people are going to say, hey, wow, they put out heat. Um, And you can't say that your music's amazing. Other people have to say it for you. And the people that have to say it have to be people up on the ladder because that makes it, when they say that, then you can say your stuff is fire. Until then, you just keep doing music and understand that everything is takes time and effort and with your constantly uh, practicing and constantly making those mistakes, Those mistakes are going to get better and better to the point where you're not going to make those mistakes anymore. And you're going to understand more and more logically where you're going to need to be and where you're at at this moment and work to get to that level where you need to be, where you can actually give out stuff to radio station DJs and give stuff out to record labels and shop your music around without getting bad feedback because nothing worse than getting bad feedback. All right, guys, um, this was episode one of, of what I said, getting into the business, the music business that is. I will probably be doing a video every week 
Um, maybe let's see how it goes. Um, but every Tuesday, I will probably put out a video. This will be the first one. But unfortunately, it's not putting out on a Tuesday. It's putting out on a Wednesday. Um, there was a lot involved in getting this video uh, with videos and storage and whatnot. So, all right, guys, take care. And I appreciate your support. Definitely subscribe to my channel. Definitely share it with your friends that want to know a lot more about music. And if you have any questions, hit me up. Um, send me your music at vinnyvenom at gmail, V-I-N-N-Y-V-E-N-O-M at gmail. Um, and like I said, I will listen to your stuff. And if I like it, I will definitely post it on my next video and let other people know on what music I believe they need to be listening to and checking out. All right, take care. Jealousy gets the best of me. If this could be. <laughs>